The measuring stick of God's love is Christ crucified. The way that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know God loves me isn't because things are going the way I prefer all the time. It isn't because everybody around me I love is making the right choices. It's because Christ came, died, and rose again and sits at the right hand of Almighty God. That's how I know God loves me. Period. And if you don't settle that in your heart, life is going to speak louder than the truth. And all of a sudden you'll have this, well, I thought you loved me. Well, if you love me, then how come? Well, why God? Well, if God loved me, then why? And you won't even be able to hear somebody preach on God's love because you're raging with questions and issues and attitudes based on the things that you're going through instead of what he went through. We need to be locked in and established in the faith. God's love for you through Jesus Christ must be settled is what I'm crying out tonight. Come on, if I drove here just to say that one thing, we can live off of that and we can run well. We have, I know it doesn't sound like some deep revelation, but listen, we've got to get established in this thing. You've heard me say this a thousand times if you've ever listened to me preach. The, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross and Christ died and crucified and raised from dead is the measuring stick of God loving you. And it should never ever be questioned or challenged by anything because it's already settled he came this first john 4 says in this love is made manifest that means to be seen and known in this that means in this one thing don't look anywhere else the measuring stick of god's love is not how your life's going right now not how people have or haven't treated you how your friends are acting come on if satan ever figures out that there's something outside of christ that determines you you're in big trouble because you got vulnerability written all over you he'll just hit every little push button and people button in your life wreck you discourage you and now that christ came gets you to say well god doesn't love me or my life won't be going like this I'm going to tell you straight, that's a cop-out. That's deception. In this, love was manifest. That means was already made seen and known that God gave His only begotten Son that you might live, not for Him, through Him. He loves me because Christ is hanging there, crucified. The measuring stick of God's love has been settled in my heart. It's not something I have to relive, revise. Re he loves me or Christ would have never came. Him hanging there is the I love you of God. You know what God's saying from heaven when Christ is hanging there? Take a good look, Dan. I know who you are. You're worth every drop of His blood. Your destiny, your potential, your created value. I know who you are. Boy, you don't even know you. But if you'll look, I'll draw you to me and I'll show you who you are. You're worth His death. Your life lived is worth it. Take a good look and see and come unto me. That's what God's crying out through Jesus. Here's good news. No matter what man did from the garden on, God never lost sight of what He made man to be. God knows who every one of us is. He knows who you are. On your darkest, most deceived, even willful day, He didn't lose sight of you. So in the fullness of time, in due time, like a root out of dry ground, He sent His Son. Dry and thirsty land. He sent His Son. Why? To put on the likeness of sinful flesh and become what we were. So we could be transformed back into what He is, a son. Amen. So did He come because we're sinners? Or did He come because we were lost sons and daughters? And our value and our destiny and our heritage was lost, it seemed. But yet not in the sight of God. So He brought His Son through the womb. Get this. Come on, either you get religious and get Easter Christmas with Jesus. Or you think and go, whoa. God of the universe put himself inside the womb of a woman. Hung out there for nine months. <laughs> Come on. God of the universe. He must value us so much. He must know something about our potential and our destiny. He must know how vital it is for us to be transformed back into His image that He would come in the likeness of sinful flesh so we could be restored back into the power of the Spirit. Amen. He was separated from God so we could be joined forever. He died so we never will. He must think a lot about people. We're saved to become the very thing that saved us 
and that's His image. What saved us is the goodness of God and who He is, the love of God that never fails. On your darkest day, He didn't lose sight of who you are, your value, your potential, your destiny. That's why He sent the Son. He didn't send the Son because you were a sinner. He, sent, he had to send His Son to die because you sinned. I understand He had to die because we sinned, but He didn't send the Son because you were sinners. He sent the Son and gave the value of His Son up on the cross because He knows there's a greater value about you than you've ever understood. So the cross is all about your value and potential. It's not about your failure and your fault. Because He takes the old off of you and puts the new on you. He changes you. He transforms you. He makes things brand new. He renews your mind. He puts a new heart in you. Come on. I, I, I was taught my whole life He died on the cross because I'm a sinner. That left me a sinner and sin was something I was. No, I'm adopted in to be a son. Adopted by the Spirit of grace. Predestined before time to be His. I've pastored for years. I've counseled people. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Why is that the issue? What He has done is the issue. Come on. He already knew what you did and what you were going to do. And why you were yet a sinner, He sent the Son. Let's get over this thing. Let's realize that, look, He made us in His image. And no matter where we've been and what we've done and how bad sin ravaged us, He never lost sight of who we are in Him. And love is simple in that light. In other words, you can't change your eternal value. You can't change your created value. You can't change who God made you to be. I don't care how much you sin, how much you miss the mark, and how much you run, God knows who you're created to be. And He's never lost sight of that. So He paid the price to redeem that truth and get the sin off of you. He was in the world. The world was made through Him and the world did not know Him. See, that fascinates me. I read that stuff and think about that stuff. The world didn't know him. It shows the state of man. He came, look at this one, it gets more intense. He came to his own. Why? Because he didn't disown, remember? And his own. Sure didn't look like his own. Sure weren't acting like his own. Sure weren't thinking like his own. Sure weren't living like his own. But guess who they were? Oh, see what's wrong with me? (laughs) That's love right there. (laughs) Oh, man, come on. It's right in your Bible. He came to his own. Why did he come? Because he knows who they are. He can't leave them that way. Even if it cost him his life, I'm going to send you a message of a lifetime to change the way things are because you're so much more. It's not even the truth about you. No matter what it costs me, even if it costs me my life, I'm coming to you that you might be saved. You can't hear love in that? Come on, God's not appalled by people. He loves people. He wants to change those things that seem appalling. We always say He loves the unlovely. It's the things that appear unlovely that He wants to remove. He loves people. Watch this. On your darkest day, on your most confused, deceived moment, He knows who you are. So He's not thrown by you. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Come on. On your darkest day. He said, that ain't you. I know you. And you're worth the blood of my Son, and I've paid a price for your redemption. This is the sense of love. This is what makes him love. He loves you in the midst of the deception, the weakness, the expressions of things outside of Christ. He has the ability to separate what you're giving yourself to from who you're created to be. He separates those two and he keeps his eyes on what you're created to be. God loves you, but he loves you for who he created you to be. He loves you for what you look like when he's in you and you're surrendered. Do you get it? It's not that he loves where you've been and what you've done. He loves what he made you for. And he loves that purpose and he loves that potential and he never let it die through man's sin. In fact, he resurrected it through the resurrection of his son. All of a sudden, my value increases and I realize I'm more than what I've given myself to. All of a sudden, I'm a pearl of great price to God. I'm a treasure in a field. And all of a sudden, he purchased the highest price to obtain me because he sees something precious about me. And all of a sudden, I'm not struggling to find who I am. I found who I am through him. Just face it. You're the pearl of great price to God the Father. That's not blasphemy. That's the gospel. You're the treasure in a field. (laughs) To me, he is. But to him, I am. 
that he would do that speaks of your value, speaks of God's love for you, speaks of the identity in which you possess through his eyes. You're worth his blood. You're worth the death of his son. Your life lived is worth his son dying to God. There's something amazing about us in his eyes. Now life taught you you're a worm. And the church taught you you were a worm. But Jesus says you're worth his blood. And you're the pearl of great price. And he found a treasure buried in a field called the earth. So he just paid for the whole package. <laughs> the redemption of mankind. Us. Your prime real estate. You are a house built for a king. He doesn't want to live in a temple made with hands. He made you to dwell in you. To be one with you. And when that got lost, it's worth any price to redeem and restore. <gasps> you have to understand the gospel reveals your value and the unfailing love of God towards your life no matter what, where you've been, what you've done, how you've acted, how you've thought. Because God sees past all that and knows who you are in the first place. I smile because the Spirit of God's in me because He wants to be. <laughs> and He loves to live in me. <laughs> I'm prime real estate. He paid, an, he paid an amazing price to live here. Can you imagine the realtor to walk in God through the planet? He owns the cattle in a thousand hill weeks. He can live anywhere. He can build a big castle in the sky and everybody at one time could see it and go, wow. You could raise your children to him. That's God's house. That's where God lives. Wow. But he wants to live in you and people look at you and go, Wow. See something different about you. You're not weighed down and pressed down by life. That circumstances aren't your barometer. And what people have and haven't said isn't what determines you. But that God sent His Son and saw the value of your destiny and your purpose and your created intention. That He would pay whatever necessary to get you back. It's the love of God. So He's walking through the earth with the realtor. He can live anywhere. And he comes to my run-down, selfish, hypocritical, sin-driven, darkness-consumed life. And he says, whoa, I want that. I want to live there. You want to live there? Yes! I want to live there! Huh? There? Oh, you don't understand because you don't see what I see. You're looking on the outside. I'm looking through destiny and purpose. I know what I'm looking at. I want that. I'm going to buy that. I want to live there. He looks in his little manual, in his little price code. Oh, that's flesh. If you're going to live there, it's going to cost flesh. Oh, I'm ready to pay. Yeah, but you don't understand. It's flesh and blood. I already have it handled. I predetermined this before the foundation of the world. I saw that. In my heart, in my vision. I saw that before anything was. And knew what I saw it to be. And I'm looking at it and I see it now. I don't know what you see. Whatever the price of it. This book says it will cost you your son. Then so be it. Price pay. Because that's my son. I'm like prime real estate to God the Father. <laughs> Think about it. He looked over the earth and found this run-down little sin-stenched shack. And he said, I'm going to cause that to be born again. Because I see what he's doing and how he's acting, but I know who he is. And I see his potential, and I know his purpose. And he sent his son to take all that off of me so I could be absolutely redeemed. Refurbished and renewed from the inside out, baby. <laughs> God said, I'm going to live right there. And he ain't leaving. He likes it here. <laughs> I'm really messing up now, Pastor. I'm telling you. <laughs> he likes it here. He would rather live in me than build some mansion in the sky for everybody to see and go, whoa. He would rather live in you than build some impressive thing in the middle of the sky for all to see and go, whoa, that's where God lives. Because here's what He wants. He wants people to look at you and go, whoa. 
that's where God lives. He loves you enough to pay the price to move inside of you. <laughs> you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty precious to him. <laughs> you're a house fit for a king. Prime real estate. Come on, he paid the blood of Jesus to get inside of us. That is more than a religious doctrine. That is intense and intimate and amazing. God wants to live in us. Why? So he can look through us, touch through us, shine through us, fulfill his image, the expression of his image through us. He made us for this very reason. And if I understand that this is why I'm alive and I yield myself to this truth, there'll be a lot of grace to walk in that purpose because it's why I'm on the planet. Come on, why would he die on a cross if you weren't worth anything? Who pays, a, who pays such a high ridiculous price for nothing? I know you people, you don't write the check unless you're sure you got a bargain. Every man comes home with the car and he's telling his wife he got the best deal in town. Ah, oh, raked him down so low, he ain't making no commission. I got the best buy and the reason you wrote the check is because you believe what you got is worth the price. Well, why would he pay such a ridiculous high price as the blood of his son to obtain you if he didn't think the purchase possession was worth it? Would anyone die and pay such a ridiculous high price for nothing? Come on, I know us people, you don't even write the check unless you think what you're buying is well worth the price. Yeah. And most of you think when you write the check, you got an extreme bargain. Or you wouldn't be writing the check. Come on, I don't know people to write checks and go, well, I shouldn't be paying this, but I really want it, but I shouldn't be paying it. It's not worth that. No, you wait till you find it on sale. <laughs> Most men come home with the new car and they are sure that they got the guy down to the rock bottom price and got the best deal in town. Come on, you don't even shell out the bread unless you think what you're buying is worth what you're paying. And yet Jesus shed his blood for humanity. In fact, the reality is you actually think what you bought is well worth the price. Most people think what they bought was a good buy. So God seems to think he got a good buy. His son for many sons. The blood of his son for the life of people restored. See, it's important that you love who you've become in Christ so you love your neighbor as yourself. I talked about that a little bit. I just didn't go into a lot of detail, but the greatest commandment is love God with everything you are. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So this thing's all about love and becoming love. So the clear view, it's not arrogance, guys. It's not presumptuous. It's not vanity, earthly vanity. Like thinking you're somebody. It's all in light of truth. It's all within perspective of the finished work of Christ. So look at yourself in the mirror and realize you have value to God is not blasphemy. You have to have value to God. He never paid such a high price. Come on. Who buys something and writes the check and spends the money and swipes the card if they don't feel what they're purchasing is worth the value Amen. that they're paying? In fact, I know you people. You actually feel, always feel like you got a bargain or you don't swipe the card. <laughs> so you actually feel like you're getting more than your, your purchase price. You, you feel like you're getting more for your money. Isn't that true? I know you guys, I'm the same way. When I leave a car dealer, I feel like I got the best buy available. Or I wouldn't have bought the car. I feel like, the, I, feel like I, I got the best deal out of that salesman. And got his commission to the most modest commission available. And you feel that way. I know guys that think they got the deal of the century. So they write the check because they feel like what they're getting in return is well worth the price. Why would he die for me? What do you mean why would he die for me? Because I'm a son from the beginning. I was the predestination of God. He knew me when you didn't. Yeah. What do you mean, why would he die for me? I have so much more to my life than what I knew and what I lived for, and God knows that. So he sent his son to die so I could finally live. What do you mean, why would he die for me? That's a simple answer. We sing songs, I'll never know why, because we're reading ourselves and weighing ourselves based on what we've been apart from him. So we valued our lives or devalued our lives based on that history. When the truth is in Christ, are you following me? Yeah. So yes, he should have. <laughs> you oughta. 
<laughs> right? Because we have life to live. He doesn't want to see life apart from us. Heaven wouldn't be the same without us. God's picture and plan wouldn't be fulfilled without you in it. You're the family portrait. Come on. Love God was never meant to be a mystery. Like, why would he love me? And there's a lot of people that don't totally understand why God loves us. They think he's just loving. And they can't relate to it, so they can't aspire to grow to be like him because they're mystified, they're confused by how God can love them because they're weighing their value based on their performance, their memory, their track record. And then the love of God is a mystery, and it's like, why would God love me so much? But by faith, we muster up faith, and we sing the song, and we trust it's true, but we're not impacted in the place of change because we don't really understand why he can love me like this. Is anybody relating? See, his love has nothing to do with where you've been. His love has nothing to do with what you've done, you haven't done. His, the reason his love never runs out on you because he'll never lose sight of who he created you to be. He'll never lose sight of your potential, your destiny, and what you look like when he lives inside of you. It's not that God loves where you've been and loves what you've done. He loves who he made you to be. He loves your potential. He loves your destiny. He loves what you look like born again. Yeah? He really does. He loves what you look like transformed. And we're like, man, I don't know why he would love me. Well, the thing that you're thinking isn't why he loves you. He loves who he created you to be. He wants to get to the real you. He loves who he created you to be. He loves your destiny in him. He loves your purpose in him. He's so wise in making us and creating us. He loves that. He's preserved that through the blood of Christ. It's always possible. He's kept the potential alive for your destiny. So when you look at that, I don't know how he can love me. It's because you're weighing yourself based on all that yuck. That's not what he loves. That's not what he sees. That's not who you are. The love of God was never intended to be a mystery. Like the church is still puzzled over the love of God. We sing songs why he would love us though. And it's a big question mark. Like why would he love me? <laughs> Come on. Who's ever heard that phrase? And that, who's ever thought, well, why would God love me? The only reason we're struggling, the only reason it's a mystery, because we're weighing and assessing our value based on life and our life's performance. And then we're looking at our assessment, we're looking at our rap sheet, and we're wondering what there is to love about me. Well, that's not what God loves. That's what God changes. See, what God loves is who he created you to be. God loves your destiny. God loves your heritage in the Lord. God loves your potential, your created value. See, we're trying to find the love of God in some mystical way, and we're trying to relate to how God can love me, but we're identifying me based on the life we know. That's the life that dies. That's the life that we say no to. That's the life that we put off. What we realize is we were living what we were never created to be. We were born into a lie. We were born into Adam and we must be born again. And because God never lost sight of our created value, our destiny, our potential, he never changed his mind about our value. So he seems to think it's worth the blood of his son Jesus for you and me to live. So he must see a whole lot more than we've produced. He must know what we look like when he's inside of us. He must know what we're capable of in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Do you get it? So the love of God is not a mystery. Please don't get trapped ever again saying, I can't believe God would love me. Believe it! Because he loves what he created you to be. He loves your destiny. He paid the price for you to write legacy. Not to mull around in where you've been and what you've done. That's not who you are. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. He came to shine the light on that kind of darkness to change your life forever. It's not like, well, we're always sinners. Well, you know, we're just going to get messed up. It's wonder God even considers us. Ah! 
He doesn't tolerate you. He loves you. And yet God seems to think shedding the blood of His Son is worth the redemption of your life. And you're the purchased possession of His blood. So God must seem to think that what He's getting is well worth the price. And we get confused by that because we weigh and identify our value based on our performance or lack thereof. We've identified ourselves through life and the way life's been and the way we've functioned. We carry our little secrets, the things that only a few know about or nobody know about. And those things try to defile us. And we look in the mirror and we see where we've been and what we've done instead of where he's been and what he's done. And all of a sudden our lives get marred and marked by that kind of thing. And we carry low levels of esteem and, and identity crisis and low levels of condemnation and guilt. And even when we're singing songs of commitment and surrender, what pricks our mind and what goes like bam, bam, is where we have been and where we haven't been and how we haven't surrendered and what we said last week that wasn't cool. And, and we just live in that place if we're not careful. And all of a sudden, when we hear a preacher say, God loves you, we have a hard time understanding how he can love us because we weigh our value based on where we've been and what we've done. But God sees you totally different, friend. God knows who he created you to be. God knows your potential. He knows if you'd ever surrender and get filled with his spirit what you're capable of. God knows what you look like when he lives inside of you. And he knows that that picture is worth the blood of Jesus. And he believes that the deposit of the blood of his son into the earth is worth the redemption of many sons. He saw fit to conceive me in the womb of my mother. He saw my days before they were seen. He knew me before I was known. Sir, there's a time to be born, and it's not an accident you're sitting in the chair. No matter what mistakes you made, no matter how you live life, your life is the will of God. Whether you knew it for 30 years, 40 years, it's irrelevant. The truth is you're here because he said so. We got to get that, guys. We got to stop thinking our life's a mistake and an action. No matter how bad we blew it, God knows the truth about us. We're not throwaways. We're not happenstance. There's a time to be born and we were created before the foundation of the world. He saw us before we were seen. There's a time to be born, the Bible says, and here you are. You're not happenstance. You're not an accident. You're not because a man and a woman came together. You're because God said so. Way before time. You weren't just called to go to church. You weren't just called to attend youth group. You weren't just called to better read my Bible. I'm a Christian. You're called to know Him. And He has known us from the beginning. Because there's a time to be born. And before time, He saw your day. And He predestined you before time to be sons and daughters through Christ. Ephesians 1 tells us that. Your life's not an accident. That's impossible. The only reason we think our life's not worth living is because life has defined our value. But the cross defines our value. And didn't have any understanding there was so much right about me at my root value, at my created value, that my inheritance was of the Lord. That I was so the purpose of God and the will of God, and if I was born, it's because God said so. 500 million sperm cells in the release of the average male. And I'm that one. (laughs) Yay! There's a time to be born. When dad went into mom on that night, and he was probably drunk. He was probably drunk, and probably mom looked good. I'm being honest. But I'm the will of God. See, all that's irrelevant. What matters is, when that seed took, life comes from God. And he said, I saw Dan before the foundation of the world. Boop, and there he is, planted in mama. 499 million sperm cells race into the egg instinctively. Eat your heart out. It's me. (laughs) Swim as hard as you can. It's me. Get there and try to get there first. It don't matter. It's me. I got that in a vision one time. I did. The Lord Lord showed me that, that, that. That all these sperm cells, Jeff, were racing to mama's egg. And they all got there before me and I was floating up on a raft with glasses and a sweet tea from down south, baby. (laughs) And I just, eat your heart out, boys, it's me. They're up there at the egg with jackhammers and saws and drills. Why can't we get in this egg? And all of a sudden I get up there and they part like the Red Sea. How'd he do that? And from the inside of the egg, because it was me. I was predestined before the foundation of the world. There is a time to be born. Life comes from God. So if there's 500 million sperm cells racing to mom's egg and it was me, that's pretty personal. 
They all swimming like crazy trying to get to the egg. They got to get in there. That's their instinctive duty, man. As soon as they're released through the man, them boys are swimming. It's the gun in the Olympic race, and they're setting record to the egg. They just, they're going. It's science. You had this stuff in school. There's, it's, 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 look, look, look. Come on, I'm in a church. I can talk like this. There's an ejaculation. There's 500 million sperm cells going somewhere. All they know is egg, get there. The first one in wins. And they just, they ain't even breathing, man. They just go. Because if they don't win, they're going somewhere. Are we okay? Hey, I think about this stuff. You know why? Because God gave me the vision. God gave me the vision in worship. I was in worship. And I was in my bedroom praying and talking to him about my creative value. And all of a sudden I saw all these squigglies racing. They were little round. They looked like balloons with strings. And I'm in worship and I went. And all of a sudden I realized they were sperm cells in a womb, in a, in a birth canal. In a, in a, in, they were going up there. And God has the ability to do this in a vision. I knew that was my mother and I knew that was my dad's was responsible for that. And, and watch. I got this picture. I know it sounds hilarious, but it really ministered to me. Because people say, well, my life's a mistake. Well, I shouldn't have been born. Who in this room? Be honest. Whoever contemplated that and actually believed for a season your life was a mistake. That you should have never been born. That had no reason to be alive. That you wish you weren't. That you couldn't have. Well, God couldn't. Come on, there's a time to be. And on that day, when I was conceived, guess what? It was my time. And ain't nothing nobody can do about it. Nobody can stop that. It was my time. You were predestined before time to be adopted in as His. Life came from Him. There's a time to be born. He saw your day before you were ever seen. He knew you well before you were known. 500 million sperm cells racing to mama's egg. And it was you. That's pretty intense. See the vision I got? <laughs> I was in prayer. I was in prayer, worshiping God. And I saw this whole school of squiggly swim by me. <laughs> There's a whole school. It looked like balloons with strings. Horizontal, cruising. And God just has a way of communicating. I knew what they were. And... I knew it was my mother. I was looking at them going up the birth canal of my mother and inside my mother. And I was like, whoa, what are you teaching me? And I saw this. It, was a, it looked like a big golf ball. They were heading to it in the distance. And it was funny because it had like that hexagon look to it. I don't know why. It wasn't just like a round ping pong ball. It, it, it kind of looked like a golf ball to me. And they're all racing to it. And I see them all go... Because I was reading scripture. God was teaching me who I was. He was showing me the value of my life. It was the most secure time ever. Like it's still that way. I'm not saying that was better then. It, it was I just came into knowing who I was. And it was like so good. And I just knew when I got saved. My life was never going to be the same. And there was no going back. Because there was nothing there. And it was like God you're so good. And I get this vision in the midst of God teaching me things. And. It was so comical. God has a sense of humor. He like has a way of communicating and he knows you. He knows how you hear what you... He... So I see this whole mass go... And I see the egg. And next thing you know, here comes this raft. And there's one squiggly in it. Got sunglasses on. Got a little iced tea with a bent straw. It's like a Veggie Tail movie. It's like, he don't got no arms. He just holding an iced tea. And somehow he's backstroking because he's facing that way. Sometimes how he's backstroking up to the egg. And he's way behind the pack. But he's chilling. He's chilling. There was a message there. 
All these guys are <laughs> salmon racing, yeah. trying to get there first. And here comes this guy. <laughs> He's just chilling. He gets up there. This is exactly what I saw. He gets up there and all these squigglies have safety goggles on. They got drills, chainsaws, and stuff. Jackhammers was the other one. Saw blades are bent. Jackhammers and drills are smoking. And they're all working hard. On the egg. Trying to get in. Nothing's working. They're frustrated. They're all trying hard. Gets up there in the raft. This one single fella gets up there in the raft. It was me. They all split like the Red Sea. And all you could see was a channel to the egg. And bent his little squiggly string down and went... Twing, twing, right inside the egg. Shoop, right in. No jackhammer saw drill. Destiny. No jackhammer drill or saw. Destiny. Calling. Duh. Duh. That was me. Woo! Man, I'm having fun. And all these squigglies, hundreds of millions, are standing there bewildered. Because I don't know where they go. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> they... They're all standing there and they're like, frustrated, drills are smoking, they're like all exasperated and they're like, how did he do that? How did he just get in? How did he get? And they're all questioning him from inside the egg. I heard my voice shouting from inside the egg because it was me before the foundation of the world. He chose me in him before I was known. I was known in him before I was seen. I was seen in him. It was me from the beginning. Oh! <laughs> and you're going to tell me you're like oh, one of millions. Technically, you're one in millions. One makes it in there. And here you sit with life inside of you. Everyone on this earth, the same price was paid for every human being. No, if the same price had to be paid for every person, then every person must have the same value. Yeah. <laughs> you don't put the same price tag on everything in the store, guys. Come on. The same price tag is on every person on the earth. Every person costs the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't you believe you're nobody? Don't believe your happenstance? Don't believe you're what grade school taught you or family taught you and what your dad did and didn't say? Don't you think any of that has to do with the truth about who you really are? The truth about who you really are can only be found through the fact that the Son of God shed His blood. There must be something amazingly valuable about every one of us if we all wear the same price tag. There ain't no hot shot, there ain't no low life. <laughs> you know what else is beautiful? It's just a cool thought. You go in a store, and there's a whole lot of items in that store. There's a whole lot of price tags. Why? Because some things in the store have different value than others. But every person I'm looking at in this room has the same price tag. You know why? Y'all have the same value. <laughs> Nobody's worth more and nobody's worth less. And if you believe different, you're being deceived because the blood was shed for all and the same price for all men. You say, but I'm not significant. You're worth the blood. Stop believing the lie. But my life doesn't really matter. He seems to think it does. He died for you so you could live. How about coming alive? Come on. Same price tag on everyone in this store. Everyone's worth the blood. Everyone costs the same once for all. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all live it. The beautiful thing about the store of humanity is we're all worth the same price. You all have the price tag of the blood hanging on you. 
He didn't say like, you know, uh, I, I, I need, I need uh, four drops to save Dan. I need half a bag to get Jason out of that thing. <laughs> it's his blood. Right. And it's speaking better things. Amen. You go to Walmart, you got price checks, barcodes, because you got all different values of all different items on the shelves. You look at the store of humanity, everybody is worth the same. There's not a mountain or a valley. It's all been. Woohoo! What makes you special is you're created for His image. And you have the potential of His purpose. And He didn't count you out. He counted you in. That makes you special and unique because there's only one you in Him. Come on! Nobody has your destiny. Nobody has your exact sphere of influence. Nobody will look exactly like you look in the Holy Spirit. You're worth the blood to Him. Redeeming that truth is why he died. Not to get you in heaven someday. But to get the truth restored back inside of you now. Because before that moment you were dead. So everlasting life starts when you come alive. There's nothing I can do to make God love me more. That is so freeing. Yes. <laughs> come on. Yay. <laughs> There's nothing I can do to make him love me more. So why don't you lighten up, get the sweat off your brow, and stop trying so hard to get God to love you. He does. He's love. And watch this. There's nothing you could do to make him love you less. See, some of us need to hear that because we carry things. And we don't forgive ourselves, even though God does. But some of us need to hear there's nothing you can do to make him love you more. To get you to stop trying so hard and just be loved. When do you just say thank you for loving me through your son? He loves me. He doesn't tolerate me. He loves me. Who's ever believed God tolerates you? He doesn't tolerate you. He loves you. He absolutely loves you to the tune of the death of his son. He believes his son dying is worth your life lived. He believes putting all your mess and all your sin and all your guilt on his son is worth getting it off of you so you can rise up and be who you were created to be in the first place. That's what he believes. He believes your life is that valuable. <laughs>